On December 17, 1990, a guest critic in the Los Angeles Times wrote about the work of our next three guests. Wrapped in the guise of a kid's show, Joel Hodgson, the human, regularly reads mail from youngsters who send him drawings of the robots. Mystery Science Theater 3000 contains some of the hippest, deepest satire of the generation. Never mind the show. What a brilliant review that was by me. It began with a guy and his puppets poking funds at awful movies on a UHF Minnesota television station in 1988. Now it is on Time Magazine's list of the 100 best TV shows of all time. Mystery Science Theater 3000, its creators now present their original snark live in a kind of riff on a riff on MST3K. It is called Cinematic Titanic. The concept for the original show, seen here on the wonders of videotape, VHS by way of YouTube, it's a little cleaner in the original first generation, as I recall, was simple and ingenious. Man in space, forced to watch bad movies with the robot puppets he invented. The three sat in silhouette in front of a truly awful movie, and thankfully, they never shut up. The Mystery Science Theater program has been off the air for a while, but now Joel Hodgson has gotten the band back together to riff on bad movies again, this time in front of live audiences. You're looking at uh, footage from one of their live DVDs, the film in question, a spectacular called East Meets Watts. And that's the cinematic Titanic crew doing its material on either side of the screen. Listen. Damn, I wish I could find a Chinese laundry somewhere in San Francisco. <laughs> The letter said, meet me at the gravel pit in America. <laughs> yeah, it's too bad the Bay Area didn't have any beautiful locations they could shoot at. Don't touch that! <laughs> oh, he walked right into a journey video. East meets Watts, and all the Cinematic Titanic titles are available for download and on DVD at CinematicTitanic.com. Right now, we've said Cinematic Titanic 31 times. <laughs> the live tour is in Massachusetts tomorrow, New Jersey on Friday, Saturday, and New York. In order left to right, Trace Beaulieu and, uh, of course, Joel Hodgson in the middle, and J. Elvis Weinstein of Cinematic Titanic. Gentlemen, it's 20 years overdue. It's a pleasure to have you here. It's Thanks. great to be here. Thank Thanks you. for having us. I have been a fan almost since the original days. And I'm sure every fan you've ever had said the same thing when they first saw it. They said, what the hell is this? And then complete submersion. How long does it take, do you think? Do, do, how, how, how quickly does a fan become a fan? Oh, it's different for everybody until you hear your joke. And your joke is in there somewhere. And how many jokes? Would you, did you ever do a, like a word count or a, or a cell count on how many jokes there are yeah. per it, episode? It hangs around 600 usually. <sighs> It, it, the first season we had we were at 300, and then the second season we got we you know once we were getting paid to do it we got to be about 600. <laughs> we saved those. We doubled our output. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Jay Elvis. Yes, indeed. Uh, the uh, I thought this was true for the little thing that I wrote, oddly enough, 20 years ago in the Los Angeles Times, and I still think it's true that people see this as well. You're having fun with with bad movies. Do do enough people in your estimation? really appreciate the deep satire and sometimes even the political satire, but more broadly sense of social satire that you've worked into every one of these things? Ah, uh, well, uh, you know, ego-wise, I'd have to say, no, of course they can't possibly <laughs> appreciate the deep satire that we do. I think it's, you know, it's, as Trace kind of said, it's like people find their jokes, you know. Uh, some people actually scold us when we get political now, you know, because they don't want that from us. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think uh, with 600 jokes, there's... Uh, you got to go for a, a lot of different levels of joke. And did you ever have you ever found that if with that volume of humor, that people just tend to, as you said, they like the ones that are their jokes, and if they don't like the other ones, don't get them, aren't politically inclined, whichever way that might be tilting, they don't notice. You basically you get graded on the ones they laugh at and nothing else, correct? Yeah, if you wait long enough, one you like will come along, and there's not there's not enough heat on the jokes. It's like. In a traditional sitcom, you got to have a yep. joke to go to commercial. We never had to do that. No, it's a perfect democracy. Every joke is equal. Right. Yeah, yeah we're never just hanging on that one scene-closing joke. Do you just the scene never closes. <laughs> it just keeps going on. Do you miss the robots? Because it seems like the fans well, have adjusted to not having... Any yeah, uh, you know what? It, I, that's something I just made up one day. It's yeah. not real. <laughs> and uh, I hate to tell you, but Trace... What? He's crow and if you listen <laughs> close yeah. enough, it's kind of like he's crow and 
If you listen close enough, he's Tom Servo, so really? you just got to pretend. We also don't miss him because people, fans actually build their own yeah, and yeah, bring them to our shows yeah. uh, for us to sign and meet. So, so we don't actually miss them because we're constantly acquainted with them. Bless them and stuff, you know, yeah. to sort of make them official. I don't miss them because now we can keep our arms down by our sides. How, you know, how rigorously, uh, how physical was that? Uh, well, it was keeping your arms up. Yeah, uh, and and neither of us are very good at upper body. It's <laughs> <laughs> a workout and a, and a job. And yeah. you have to do everything backwards too, because you're looking in a monitor. Uh, so backwards and in Chinese, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> just to make it harder. Uh, can the live audience, when you do it, do it now in this environment where you're, you're seated at the desks with with scripts in front of you and lamps and all the rest, does the the fact that it's live? Can the audience screw you up by laughing too much, by enjoying it too much? Well, it, it, that's certainly in the good problem that's to have <laughs> category. I mean, that's part of the learning process we've had with doing the live shows is that sometimes three jokes are going to get wiped out because yeah. of a laugh, and you just have to be ready to accept that it's and find that right end point yeah, back it's in. It's less work for us when they laugh. It's <laughs> like, oh, flip the pages. Come on. Certainly, and I know you've been asked this uh, for the whole, you know, 22 years off and on, but certainly no film director, or maybe, maybe there have been three who have ever tried this, have set out to make the worst movie of all time. Uh, so there must be some mixture between offense by the people who've actually produced these things and is there still, are there some people who become fans of seeing their product resuscitate or repurposed, as the kids would say today? I think there are. I mean, we actually had uh, we had uh, we did a movie called The Alien Factor oh, for right. Cinematic Titanic, and one of the cast members and slash crew members of the movie <laughs> showed up to one of our shows in L.A. and he talked to us afterwards, and he was super excited that it was just get, seeing the light of day. Is it is it remarkable to you that there is? I'm presuming that there is a fresh supply of this stuff still out there, and it's been there all this time. Is it amazing? Because if you sit, you're watching on television, you have no idea that people actually would sell some of these movies and expect people to pay their way in to see them without three guys sitting there uh, making fun of them. It's just remarkable. Some of these said, like, oh, we can get away with this. Well, they had, basically, they did it with really good posters. Because back in the day, you didn't know what you were going <laughs> to see. So, you know, you'd go into a dark room, and then whatever happened, happened. So you didn't yeah, a lot of the same stress. Uh, drive-ins too. It oh, just, yeah. They just Kids pumped it into it that out. market. Yeah. Did you? Do you think you guys invented uh, like DVD commentary before there were DVDs and, yes. and the internet and all the rest and, and snark <laughs> in general? It. Yes. We so did you both got both of those snark and DVD commentary. We uh, invented those. And and like Twitter. And stuff like that, in a sense. I, There's a little I, I sort of snark quality to know. I don't know. know what that is. <laughs> Did you get any money out of inventing all these things? No. no. Are you getting money out of inventing this no. thing? This? No. no. <laughs> so, I have, so I can't go for free on Saturday night. I better pay my way in. No, no, no. Yeah, you get the pass. No. Since you wrote that thing in 1990. Like, you're just getting around to it. That's we right. use that in our press kit, by the way. Really? We actually use that quote, yeah. Is that amazing? Yeah, yeah. for sure. Does that um, mean we got to pay him? No. No, that would be payola. Oh, and no one does that. No. <laughs> Joel Hodgson, Trace Beaulieu, and J. Elvis Weinstein of Cinematic Titanic. Northampton, Massachusetts tomorrow, Princeton on Friday, and New York City on Saturday. We'll see you then. Uh, my pleasure to have you here, gentlemen. Our Thanks. Pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for all the laughs.